Hey everybody, Wayne here. In today's overview and review, I am taking a look at Manstein's War, Decision in the West, 1940, designed by Joseph Miranda and published in World of War Magazine number 84. Manstein's War simulates the German offensive in Western Europe, or the Battle of France, um, that occurred between May and June of 1940. Historically, the Germans shocked France and the Low Countries and pushed the Western Allies off the continent. It is an operational scale game, and the system relies on players taking turns drawing command markers to activate their forces. Besides regular army group command chits, you will be drawing every turn. Each player has special mar markers which provide additional operational capabilities. The German goal is to seize the ports and sources of supply in France, while the Allies are trying to hold out and, if fortune favors them, destroy two German depots. If neither side achieves a sudden death victory, then it comes down to victory points that are accrued from eliminating enemy units and occupying cities and other victory point hexes. Let's do a quick overview. I do have a partial playthrough for an in-depth look at the game. I'll cover my pros and cons, and we'll wrap up with my final thoughts. All right, let's take a look at the map here. Um, you can see that it is a hex map. It's a hex encounter game. I have the map all set up. Now, for the setup, there's not a um, defined setup where it says, you know, this unit in this hex, this unit in this hex, etc. Instead, it's more of a free form. Um, you are, first it's the allies, though. They, they do set up first, and then the Germans afterwards. You're giving them an advantage, which, to start the campaign, obviously the Germans had the advantage. They would have the advantage. Um, you set up according to the supply units. You set them, and then you're able to put the units for that command group or that army group within the supply range of the, of those uh, mobile supply units. So, like I said, it's Hex Encounter. Fairly standard with the counters, right? I mean, you can see them. I'll have a little graphic pop up on the screen. Very standard, you know, the NATO symbology in the middle determining what unit it is. On the left-hand side, you can see what army group it's assigned to. On the right-hand side, you have the unit ID. You know, up top, it tells you, is it an, you know, a core size, army size? Most of the units are either army or core sized. Um, in the bottom, you'll have two or three numbers, attack, movement, or if there's three, attack, defense, movement. Um, you're moving hex to hex, just again, like any standard hex encounter game. Now, with the map, like I said, I do have it uh, set up here. I kind of have a beginning setup that I created, semi-historical, um, at least based on the German side with the certain army groups, army group B, army group A, army group C, um, the Panzers over here. Um, you can see, you know, Germany here, just to give you an idea of the map, the actual uh, map that you're playing on over here, and then a whole bunch of holding boxes. You have the Dutch, Netherlands here, Belgium, France, with a lot of French units, and some British British Expeditionary Force units. How it works is each turn, you're going to be drawing a command marker, so like a chit pull. Each side is going to have their own cup. You take turns drawing, depending on who has the initiative. You're going to draw, and it's going to tell you when you draw the command marker, it's going to have something on there. For instance, it'll say, oh, the Netherlands. So now the Netherlands are going to go ahead and take their turn activating their units, um, etc. If you draw more of a, thinking of more of, let me get a first army group. Okay, so for the allies, you draw the first army group. This is going to give you even more abilities. And what's going to happen is each time you draw a marker, you're going to be able to activate whatever army group that is. And then also you're going to activate some air units. So at the beginning of a turn... You're going to be doing refit, supply, standard things like that. But then you're going to have air units you can assign for, for the Germans, they can do city bombing. The Allies don't do city bombing. But the Allies and Germans both do either air superiority, so the air units fight each other, or assigning them for ground support, you know, tactical air support. Um, at, after that, you go into activating your units. You're moving that command, moving, and then fighting. Um, when you have the different markers... Like I said, you are drawing back and forth. So, you know, the Germans get to draw, activate one, you know, army group or set of units. Then the allies do back and forth. Besides the regular command markers, like first army group, you have things like plan R, or you'll have Manstein's plan for the Germans. And there's a whole bunch of other ones, Rommel, Hoth, etc. Those will give special activations, special abilities besides the um, regular army groups. So units can possibly be activated more than once in a turn, as long as you have the right chits, it's going to activate them. So you're moving, you're doing combat, pretty standard. Again, check out my full uh, playthrough, or not full play, partial playthrough, excuse me, to really see, you know, full uh, turn in action for both sides. Um, ultimately, you know, the Germans, they're pushing, pushing into the low countries, they're pushing into France. 
Supply lines are going to get extended a little bit, may struggle with that eventually, but at first it shouldn't be too, too hard. Low countries are likely to fall pretty fast. You can see the Germans have a lot of strong units here, probably going to push through all my games. They certainly did. And they certainly did historically French and the British are going to put up more of a fight, but it's definitely going to turn into a lot of a war of attrition, um, where the allies are generally speaking, trying to hold back the Germans here. Um, again, I mentioned victory points already, you know, trying to capture Either the Allies' sudden death, capturing two supply depots, you know, supply positions for the Germans. Um, same thing for the Germans, you know, flipping around. They're trying to catch or they're trying to take um, the supply areas from the Allies. Most often, though, it goes to the victory point comparison to determine who is the victor. So I think that covers the core of the game. Obviously, there's a lot more to it, um, but I want to get on to my pros and cons and my final thoughts. All right, pros and cons. Cons first, as always, and we'll end with my pros. First off, there are some quality of life issues that plague the game. Um, an example is the description of combat results. They're in the back of the rule book. So you have the combat results tables, and you have two combat results tables for assault combat and then for mobile combat, which is which is a nice little feature, by the way. But all it all it gives is two letter designations of the combat result, right? Well, you can't remember all of them. There's actually thirteen of them. So with 13 possible combat results, you know, I had difficulty remembering all of them. So it's a little bit of a pain sometimes referring to the rule book. I made a, uh, a quick little cheat sheet where I wrote them up and then printed it out and I have it next to, next to me when I play. So I'm not flipping just for that. Second, um, there are some counter errata. Uh, a counter that the rule book says lacks a reinforcement code actually does have it. So that threw me off a little bit. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any guidance on where to set up reserve units. The, reserve, the rules also make no reference to the British having a mobile supply unit of their own. So again, kind of not sure where to set that up. You know, just kind of go with the general flow of the game, setting it up with making sense, using common sense. You know, but a little bit of a rata. Finally, I had some confusion with supply, aka logistics, that stems from rulebook errata, or at least what seemed like rulebook errata. So there are supply sources on the map. And then, which, you know, obviously the standard, right? The standard symbol, the like divided, divided circle symbol. Um, and then each army group comes with a mobile supply unit. So to be supported, a, in, you know, in supply, the game generally calls it supported, unsupported. A unit must be within the certain number of hexes equal to its movement factor. Pretty simple, right? So it's kind of from the supply source to the mobile supply source, and then from the mobile supply source to that unit based on their movement factors. Pretty simple, and it's by hex, not by terrain. So just literally count one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. You're good. However, when it comes to the rules um, for the mobile supply units, it says that the mobile supply unit doesn't need to trace supply, or as the game calls it, LOC line of communication. Then in the same section, it describes the process of those mobile units tracing supply. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. How that, I'm not sure what that is. What that means exactly? Um, if that's a rata or not. I'm also not sure if. With controlling cities, if that changes the uh, supply depots, um, other than the victory point aspect of it. Although, you know, and, let's be, and the reason I'm kind of confused on it a little bit is that the German player does quickly run out of their supply lines. You know, if you're moving into Western France, you cannot be supplied from Germany anymore. So you do run out of supplies, so now your units are unsupported, so they are going to be weaker when it comes to attacking, doing combat, etc. Now, I did... You know, which, which, let's be honest, right? So moving moving past the supply lines, that's a part of war. Um, you know, having the mobile supply units help with that makes sense, right? They kind of, they stay behind the army, but they're close, etc. It seems to make sense. It works gameplay-wise. Now, I did ask on Constant World, and the developer, uh, Doug Johnson, was kind enough to respond, which I appreciated. And, he you know, he kind of answered my question. But I have to be honest, though, I didn't fully understand what he meant when he described the supply situation for the mobile supply units. I just... It didn't quite grok for me, right? And that's okay. Maybe that's on me. Hey, maybe it'll be different for you. Um, but I will say also that Joseph Miranda, the designer, chimed in that the Germans have an air supply ability, although that is an optional rule. And you guys know I like to play and review my games based on the base rules, right? I don't throw in optional rules and then review it. That's Optional rules are optional for you, and they're always appreciated. But I want the base game. That's what I play, and that's what I base my reviews on is the base game rules because that's what the majority of people are going to bust out and start playing. But overall, although I'm a little confused by it, it's not the first time a game and supply has confused me. 
It's probably the least fun part of <laughs> Hex Encounter games to me is kind of tracking supply. An important part of war, absolutely. But the more kind of, um, the more, you know, details to it and the more steps there are to it, the more it, it kind of is, I struggle a little bit with it. But overall, nice to have, you know, the options, nice to have the air supply and overall, not too complicated. Okay, let's get to the pros. I simply love how the chip pull works in this game. With the overall army group command markers that come back every turn, combined with those specialized chits that portray certain generals, you know, I mentioned General Rommel, General Hoth, um, or Field Marshal, or whatever his title was at the time, um, their pl and plans, you know, special plans, and their impact on the campaign, you know, you get, you get a historically accurate taste of the campaign while also making the game very solitaire friendly, right? You don't need a lot of special rules, you're just drawing a chit, you're looking at it, you're looking at the chart, it's going to tell you exactly what it does, very easy to manage, while also very solitaire friendly. Second, the large hexes on the map, they're simply fantastic. You know, I mentioned this before um, on my my recon, on bagging, mentioned it in my playthrough. I just love it. it. Makes everything from movement to combat easier. Most of us, you know, we played hex counter games where the hexes are, you know, barely larger than the counters. It just makes the game feel more fiddly, right? Now, sometimes that's unavoidable. You have a certain amount of counters, you have combat units, you have uh, supply markers, you have uh, status markers, etc. And you have you have to have the hexes to, to simulate the battlefield. However, fortunately for us, in Manstein's War, we are blessed with large hexes that can reasonably hold pretty much everything. You know, and as a reference, a hex could contain a fortress unit, an aircraft counter, a mobile supply unit, multiple cores, and an army unit, you know. Now, at that point, you'd still have to stack some of the counters, but overall, it's just easier to manage everything on the map when the hexes are large enough to place some counters side by side. Finally, you know, I feel the game does an excellent job simulating the battle for France in 1940. At first, at first glance here, when you're looking at it, the sides look fairly equal, um, especially when you kind of factor in the French and British combat power, you know, arrayed down here, at the border of France. However, very quickly as you play, you, you know, you can see the German superiority with command and control, which is primarily handled by all the special command markers they get that they had during the campaign in history manifest in the game. And as soon as those allies are on their back foot, which happens quickly as the Germans overwhelm the Netherlands and Belgium and knock them out of the war, it's very hard to pivot and get the German offensive slowed down to the point where you can conduct effective counterattacks. Now, there are things you can do as the allies to help your cause. One pro tip I can recommend is do your best to take and hold any one of the German cities on the first turn so you can have a, the initiative the next turn. But the harsh truth is for the allies, it's more of a holding action, you know, trying to deny the German player territory, which in the end will translate to victory points for you and less for them. The gameplay and system just feel right for the campaign. All right, my final thoughts. Manstein's War is one of the better war games I have played in 2022, and any war gamer with an interest in World War II should take a look at it. It's also very solitaire friendly thanks to the chip pull activation mechanic. It's not without its flaws. I've already mentioned my confusion around supply, you know, and then there is some errata, right, with a few of the counters. However, I feel the design, gameplay, and presentation more than make up for it. This is one of those war games where I hate to use the term magazine war game anywhere with it. Because when you hear that term, you know, you may think, oh, subpar, underbaked, it's underdeveloped, right? They're just rushing it out. That's simply not the case with Manstein's War. If this had been released as a box game, no one would bat an eye. Overall, I feel that Manstein's War would be a lot of fun two-player, and I know I had a blast with it playing solo. It will definitely be staying on my shelf. All right, everyone, I hope you enjoyed the overview interview. Comment below, let me know what you think of my review here. What do you think of this game? You know, have you played it yet? Are you now going to pick it up? You can take a look at it, you know, a closer look, a little more research on it. Just let me know. Let me know your feelings on it. Until next time, everyone. Later.